Our hymnals, please, and turn to 448, and let's stand together. 448, He ransomed me. Praise the Lord. I hope He has ransomed you. Amen. 448. There's a sweet and blessed story of the Christ who came from glory just to rescue me from sin and misery. He in loving kindness sought me and from sin and shame has brought me. Hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me. Hallelujah, what a Savior who can take a poor lost sinner him from the miry clay and set him free. I will ever tell the story, shouting glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me. From the depth of sin and sadness to the heights of joy and gladness, in mercy full and free. With his precious blood he bought me, when I knew him not he sought me, and in love divine he ransomed me. Hallelujah, what a Savior who can take a poor lost sinner, lift him from the miry clay and set him free. I will ever tell the story, shouting, glory, 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 hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me. By and by, with joy increasing and with gratitude unceasing, lifted up to be with Christ eternally. I will join the host there singing in the anthem ever ringing to the King of love who ransomed me. Hallelujah, what a Savior who can take a poor lost sinner, lift him from the miry clay and set him free. I will ever tell the story, shouting glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me. Amen. Praise God, he ransomed me. I hope he's ransomed you. He can today if you are, haven't been ransomed. So let's uh, pray and ask God's blessing on the service today. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for allowing each one of us to be here today. Thank you, Lord, for the Bach family being with us. We pray your special blessing upon them, uh, especially on their, their father who's having difficulty, uh, difficulty with his visa getting out of Australia. We do pray that uh, you would open the door for him to, to be cleared to come home. And so, Father, we're asking your blessing on our services today. May everything that we say and do bring honor and glory to your name. Lord Jesus, if there's one here today that does not know Christ, would you please speak to that heart? Help them to understand that they're lost without Jesus. And only Jesus Christ can save them from sin. Only he can save them from eternal hellfire. So Lord, I pray that they would turn their heart and their soul to Christ today. Lord, I pray that you, you would encourage each one of us. Challenge us where we need to be challenged, Father. And Lord, I, speak, I pray that you would speak to every heart. May we, we receive a blessing today. Please bless our speakers. Give them the words to say. Fill them with your, your power and your might. Lord, in Jesus' precious name we ask. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Please turn with me to 269. To, 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 to 269. Under his wings I'm safely abiding. 269.
song before the Bach family comes to uh, give us some, sing, sing for us. Uh, 436 please. 436. Bring them in. Bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Amen. 436. A blessing to have the Bach family with us this morning, and they are going to come and sing sing a special music, a special song for us. If I can get my words right, 
Come, come right along. family are, are missionaries to Alaska to the town they're stationed in the town of Hydra is that right and uh, they they uh, reach out into uh, the, the the hard to get to two communities both in Canada and Alaska so please be praying for them and it's a blessing to have the young men here today we're gonna have all of these four four older young men preach for us today two before lunch and two after lunch so uh, please stay uh, after lunch is over and we're going to have Brother Jeremiah come and preach for us right now. If you would, please turn your Bibles to the book of John. The book of John in chapter 20. Today we... We're going to look at the topic of Jesus' resurrection. The title of this message is The Tomb. Now, you may ask, why do you want to preach a message on the tomb? Well, it's because of the end of the story that makes it so wonderful Amen. of a subject. John in chapter 20, we'll first start reading in ch chapter 19 and verse 41. It says, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they, the, there laid they Jesus, excuse me, there laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Chapter 20 and verse 1, it says, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, I ask that you would be with my mouth, that I would speak what you would like, have me to speak. Lord, I pray that it would be a blessing, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we find here 
the tomb. And what we're first going to look at this morning is the new tomb. In verse 41, it says, Wherein was never a man yet laid. Find the new tomb. And we're going to find what the tomb shows us. We find Jesus came into this world and lived a perfect life for an imperfect world. Jesus came to this world to die a willing death for an unwilling world. He came to this world to be buried in an unprepared tomb. It was in a world that was an unprepared world. This new tomb shows us Jesus' perfect love to come down and get buried in this unprepared tomb. Jesus lived a perfect life for us. And we all know this. And he died a perfect death for us. And he was buried in this tomb for us as well. We find this new tomb, it shows us how perfect God's love was to come and die for sinners. When we're not, we're not deserving what Jesus did for us. Because we we're unperfect. It was us that should have been on the cross and should have been buried. But Jesus was for us. He took our place. And then also we find it was a sealed tomb. We can find what the sealed tomb teaches us. In Matthew in chapter 27, we could turn there. Matthew in chapter 27, verse 62. It talks about how the Pharisees were concerned now that Jesus was buried that his disciples would come in and steal him away and say, Jesus rose from the dead by night. And, well, not that he rose from the dead, sorry, but that his disciples took him to say that he rose from the dead by night. And they were really concerned about this because they knew that Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead in three days. And so... In verse 66, it says, So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. They said, we're going to make absolute positive that none of his disciples are going to be able to steal him away. The sealed tomb shows us the attempts of Satan to stop Christ from getting the victory at a time when the devil thought he had the victory. He thought he had triumphed over Jesus and that he was sealed, secure in this tomb, and it wasn't going to be opened. We find that the sealed tomb shows us the devil's attempt to stop Jesus from triumphing. But it only added to the fact, when, after Jesus rose from the dead, how powerful Jesus was. We'll look at that a little later. It brings us to the open tomb in, in John, in chapter 20, in verse 1, it says that Mary Magdalene came to the sepulcher, and it says, And seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. In, in, in Luke, in chapter 24, in verse 2, it says, And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. If you turn to Luke 2, we'll continue that reading. Luke Chapter 24, sorry, Luke, and chapter 24, verse 4 through 8. And it says, And it came to pass as they were much perplexed about the stone being rolled away. It says, When they're much perplexed, it says, Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. It says, remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. It says, and they remembered his words. What powerful, powerful words. But I did just get ahead of myself. Let's go back to looking at the open tomb. God's power was seen in the tomb being open. It showed God's power 
God's triumph over the power of the powers of darkness, the principalities of darkness. You know, I, I had the opportunity of going to Israel back, I think it was four years ago, and I visited the tomb of Jesus where they believed that Jesus was buried and rose again from. And I believe they got the spot. And, it, and by that tomb, there's a garden. And I went, we saw the tomb. It had no stone on it. And you could even see the iron bars that were inside the tomb that were sheared off when Jesus rose from the dead. They believe that was where they sealed the tomb. They had an iron bar on one side of the rock and an iron bar on the other. You could see where it was sheared off. And it was just an amazing spot. It shows God's power over the power of darkness. Amen. In Philippians 3 and, and verse 10, it says, That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And then that brings us up to the empty tomb. And this is in Luke chapter 24, where he says, Why seek ye the living among the dead? It says, He is not here but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. These are very, very powerful words where it says, why seek the living among, among the dead? You know, we serve a living Savior. Amen. He is not dead. He is risen and he's alive today. The open tomb is the only way anyone could see that it is empty and that it was empty. You know, Jesus didn't need to roll away the tomb to rise from the dead. But he wanted to let you know the power of his resurrection and also that the tomb was empty. And I've been in that tomb. What a blessing it is that Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. The empty tomb, it teaches us some things. Back in John chapter 20, The empty tomb teaches us some things. John in chapter 20. In verse 1 again it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. We find the first thing that this empty tomb can show us and give us is it gives us proof that Jesus really is the Messiah. Jesus, when he was on this earth, he gave us words and, and, and stuff that he was going to fulfill. And he fulfilled his words perfectly. And he, he said he was going to rise again the third day. The scribes and Pharisees even knew that. That's why they set a watch. It says, remember how this deceiver said he was going to rise from the dead in three days? But he did rise from the dead. He fulfilled his words perfectly. perfectly. His prophecies were perfectly fulfilled. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a book to show us of the coming Messiah. And there's many prophecies that when Jesus came on the earth, he fulfilled perfectly. From him dying to him rising again. From the virgin birth which is the very beginning to the very end. Even the scribes and Pharisees believed when Jesus rose from the dead. They believed that Jesus rose from the dead. That's why they gave money to those that watched Jesus rise from the dead, so they wouldn't tell. They believed. They paid the watch, the watch that was there at, at Jesus' resurrection to keep their mouth shut. So this empty tomb, it gives us proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Not only does it give us proof that Jesus is the Messiah, it gives us personal assurance that Jesus is the Messiah. We can have personal assurance. We find Mary, when she saw the, to the open tomb, she didn't believe Jesus had risen from the dead. She thought someone had taken him by night, even though they had sealed it and set a watch. And the watch, it says, when Jesus rose from the dead, they fell as dead men. They couldn't move. So we find that, that Mary herself did not believe. In John, in chapter 20, 
In verse 15, it says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him thence, or hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. See, she didn't even believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. But when Jesus said unto her, it says in verse 16, it says, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. When, she, when Jesus called her name, she turned around and said, Master. She knew who she, she, knew who she was. Sorry, who he was. And when Jesus calls us by name, we should know who he is too. We find another person who didn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. His name was Thomas. In chapter 20, in the same chapter, we find in verse 24, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That doesn't sound like someone who was going to believe, no matter what. He didn't believe he would ever believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. But then... We find in verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. It says, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. And this is how you know Jesus didn't need to roll the stone away. It says the doors were shut when Jesus appeared in the room. But that reason that the Jesus rolled the stone was so you can see in it, that you can see it's empty. It says, the doors being shut. And stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. It says, Then said he to Thomas, Reach thither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach, th and it says, And reach into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Amen. And Thomas said unto him, My Lord and my God. Amen. When Mary saw Jesus, she said, Master, when Thomas saw Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. And in the same way, when Jesus showed himself to me when I was lost and a sinner, when he saved my soul, I could say the same thing. My Lord and my God, he is my master, gives us personal assurance when we see that Jesus has risen from the dead. That's what the empty tomb shows us. And not only that, the empty tomb shows us the power and authority that Jesus has to send us into the uttermost part of the world. In Matthew 28, we find the Great Commission. We find where Jesus gives us a commandment. He commanded us to go into the world. Matthew 28, verse 18, says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We find that power demonstrated in the empty tomb. Verse 19, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. It says, Jesus has the power to send us into the world. He has, and when he says that he will go with us until the end of the world, he means it. This is amazing to me where God uses us, even though we are not perfect. Through Jesus' blood, he makes us perfect. And he gives us, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Now go. He says, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we find some things about the tomb. It was a new tomb. Jesus came into this world. He lived a perfect life. And he died in our place. 
He was buried in this new tomb. It shows us God's perfect love. We find the sealed tomb. It says, so they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. No way were they going to steal Jesus, but Jesus rose from the dead. Anyway, the open tomb shows us, it shows us God's power over the principalities of darkness. You know, we have, the powers of darkness are real. They're a real thing. They are powerful, but they're not powerful enough when Jesus steps on the scene. Then we have the empty tomb. It shows us that God has all power in heaven and earth. It shows us, it gives us proof that Jesus is the Messiah. It gives us personal assurance. It gives us the power and authority to go in his name, teach the gospel to every creature. You know, we were going through Salt Lake City. I told Brother William this. We were going through Salt Lake City, and I asked that we would go through Salt Lake City. We are going to bypass it by, I think, 11 minutes. And the Lord has called me to reach uh, Mormons and to have a focus on reaching Mormons for, for Christ. And so I wanted to see Salt Lake City again. I had been there about four years ago, which it didn't seem that long um, ago, but it has been four years. I was 16 years old. And so uh, they said, well, that, that's reasonable. Let's go through Salt Lake City and just stay on the highway, but we'll, we'll go through the Salt Lake City. So we passed where we were going to go off, and, and about five minutes after we passed where we were going to go before, the traffic starts slowing down. And then we come to a complete stop. And uh, the kids were like, hey, this is your fault, you know. We could have bypassed this. And uh, so we were there, and uh, I got out of the vehicle. There was somebody right next to me. I started talking to him, and, and uh, he said it was an 18-wheeler that had tipped over into the road and uh, blocked both lanes of traffic. And he said uh, he had a feeling we were going to be there a while. And so... The kids were all like, you know, this is my fault. So I had to make good of it. So I said, uh, I'm gonna just give me a bunch of tracks, and I'm going to go down, and I'm going to pass out tracks down the interstate. Now, um, I never had the opportunity to pass out tracks on the interstate, so I took it. And uh, so I went out there with my brother Joel and, and Mark. We were passing out tracks. We got out a lot of tracks going down because people were bored. They were sitting there with nothing to do. And so it was a perfect opportunity to give out tracks. And... Uh, there was one email that came in from, from the, that they emailed the, the email that was on the track, and he said that he had just become a new Christian about a year ago, and that he was trying to encourage himself in the Lord, and, and he, he kind of explained a little bit about himself. And he said, this track, I, he said, I believe it was the Lord showing me that I'm on the right track. And so it, that was really encouraging to see, and so I say, Kids, there was a reason the Lord had us go down that way. So now I'm no longer the bad guy uh, because we got some tracks out. And so it was a blessing. But what gave, a, gave me the encouragement to do that was Jesus' resurrection and his charge to us that that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to give out the gospel no matter what. And so a little bit about myself, the Lord saved me when I was 14 years old, and when I was 16, that's when the Lord uh, showed me that he wanted me to reach the Latter-day Saints, have a focus toward, I don't know where that's all going to go, but the Lord's given me a burden for uh, the Latter-day Saints or the Mormons. They don't like being called Mormons, but uh, that's what they've been. They, they changed it. We're the Latter-day Saints. We're not Mormons anymore. So anyway, uh, I can still call them Mormons because that's what they are. And so that's what the Lord has directed my attention to, and I, I praise the Lord for that. But if you can get anything from this message, just remember Jesus' power to send us. And even though we're not worthy, Jesus is worthy. And that gives me encouragement to go on. Thank you, Pastor Sealy, for the opportunity, and I hope that was a blessing. Let's stand together, please. Turn with me to 251. 251. Almost persuaded now to believe. I wonder if there's somebody here that is in that, that boat that...
King Agrippa, I believe it was, was in after Paul preached his message. And King Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I wonder if the empty tomb this morning has almost persuaded you. I hope it has done more than almost persuaded you. I hope it has persuaded you to be a Christian. You see, almost getting saved doesn't get you out of hell. Almost believing doesn't give you a home in heaven. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ alone. Put our faith in the empty tomb. He came out of that tomb to prove that he can save you and I. He has the power to, to raise himself from the dead. He has the power to take unto himself eternal life. Therefore, he has the power to give us eternal life as well. Amen. So if you're, not, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, please come and we'd love to share with you how you can know Christ. As we sing 251, Christian, if God has spoken to your heart, why don't you do, do business with God as we sing? Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul. Consider the, the, the scope and eternity, what that, what that represents. Right. In hell, burning for all of eternity, with no hope of getting out, no hope of relief, no hope of the torture and the torment stopping, almost but lost, lost, lost. Amen. I hope you're not lost here today. Amen. If you are, you can be saved. Right. You can be saved. You can... Just because you didn't come forward right now doesn't mean you can't be saved. You can be saved anywhere. I was saved in, in my living room uh, 30, almost 30 years ago. It'll be 30 years ago in July. Saved in my living room. on my. I think, I think it was sitting on my dad's lap. I believe it was. Six years old. And uh, dad led me to the Lord. My dad was saved when he was walking to church. You don't have to be saved in church. You can be saved anywhere. Just like you, you can pray to God anywhere. You can be saved anywhere. So the invitation is still open. You can still be saved. Amen. We're going to take about a 15-minute break and come back and start five minutes till the hour. Five minutes till the hour.